Today we are going to be discussing Insight Managed Mobility for Apple. Uh, we are joined today by Evan Tomlin, who is the Director for Solutions Architecture, and Matt Scaff, the Global IT Director for Insight Internal IT. Just a couple things to point out. There will be time at the end for Q&A, 5, 10, 15 minutes, somewhere in there. Also, if there's anything that you hear that you find exceptionally interesting that you want to share on social media, please feel free to do so. If you wouldn't mind, make sure to remember to include the hashtag JNUC2018. Cool? Thanks. Without further ado. Sorry, this is all good. No smoke, no fireworks. There's so many delightfully awkward moments when you present. That's one of them. So we got that out of the way. Um, I was telling the story previously that I was at a Gartner conference a few years ago where the presenter thought it would be interesting if he jumped up on stage right at this moment. His shins clipped this, and he fell on his face. And there was equal gasps and laughter. So as far as I'm concerned, the bar is low, and now we're, we're rising above. Good deal. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, Evan Tomlin. Um, I, uh, among other things at Insight, run the mobility and end-user compute business commercially. Matt is my peer in internal IT. Uh, so we're going to give you, I think, a perspective that's pretty interesting today, which is Insight is unabashedly in the services business for the Apple ecosystem. That extends into players that you would traditionally correlate with resell, right? So we're in the supply chain business. We're also in the integrator business. We're also in the managed mobility services business and a variety of other things that we've sort of glued together into an offer that we're really excited about that we're in market with. But instead of this just being sort of a sales commercial focus, here's what we do, uh, let's come talk to you about things that you're kind of keeping in-house as opposed to leveraging partners for, we thought it'd be interesting if we kind of took a mirroring strategy with this, which is to say that Insight's own journey with Apple is absolutely reflective of the market trends around Apple. So not only are we in market with these services, we're actually inside Insight with these services. And we kind of want to tell that story in a way that's meaningful, because we think it validates a lot of the trending that's been talked about at length this week. Uh, and it kind of gives you a practical, sort of under the covers view of what being an Insight Services client looks like. So without further ado, I will go to the clicker. Insight Management Mobility for Apple. Uh, so let's uh, talk about, as I go through the build slide, uh, fundamentally something that we're encountering everywhere in the market. It seems to be this phenomenon, which is, about five or six years ago, there were pockets of the business that forced Apple adoption, right? So usually when we're talking to customers, and I'll let Matt chime in on this in a second, there's some driver to put Apple as an available product on the baseline. And usually there's a person that's hired that knows some scripting, that knows Jamf, and it just kind of sat there. That's our observation for the last five or six years. Now there seems to be a fresh wave around employee choice in the enterprise, and that is occasioning all sorts of questions that really hadn't been countenanced before. So Matt, in terms of Insight's journey, can maybe walk us through what was Apple, what was choice a few years ago, what is it now, how has that evolution ran? Sure. Team? Thanks, Evan. So yeah, I think it is an important story, because when we look from years ago, as Evan pointed out, we had Mac in the environment, but it wasn't really forefront. It was kind of in a containment mode. We thought we needed to do something with it. We had it there, but it wasn't as available as what we wanted it to be. Uh, when we looked at choice, as I've mentioned too, there's a lot of important components to that. It impacts our employee retention. It impacts our morale, productivity, satisfaction, all those types of variables. So as we looked at that, and then we also looked in-house with our services organization was to be uh, able to do with their expertise, it was how do, we, how do we change, how do we alter, how do we get that to the forefront, which was important. So through the use of our own services, as uh, Evan mentioned, we've, we've brought that and changed that from a containment mode to something that's more available to our employees. Um, I, and our employees were asking for it. It was something we wanted to do. Um, it's been very positive in that journey so far. Yeah. So. And it, it's sort of interesting, and as you look at, again, the, the obligatory sort of industry notes, uh, the, the play by Apple, I think, is very clever, right? Because what occurred five or six years ago really wasn't a level playing field. It was there's some disruption in the business, so IT is forced to pocket and contain the devices. Whereas now, you know, the big bet from Apple is if it's on a level playing field and the devices are appropriately mainlined in terms of their provisioning and their management, and the, the user experience is good, if not great, then consumer sort of predilection will come in, 
which means that you're going to see a massive share shift between PC and Apple, right? So the story goes, we, we believe that story. And it's interesting um, when you look at what we've done, right? So Matt has been kind of a, at the front end of raising his hand and saying, we're gonna actually going to do a Mac as a choice program that's going to appropriately mainline the devices. Well, what does that mean? So we worked hand in hand with Apple Professional Services. We worked hand in hand with Jamf. We had a pretty interesting scenario to assess, right? Because we manage Windows endpoints using X methodologies and tools. That's obviously not going to work for a modern Apple program. But we have MDM in place, so what are we doing here? Right, so we went through all the typical assessment of, am I going to have one tool to rule them all? Am I going to have a best of breed tool? And how are we going to architect that? So Jamf being the best of breed tool, we brought that in. Did the integration work with our own internal services personnel, the people on the commercial side of the business working hand in hand with Jamf, hand in hand with Apple, to construct a zero touch provisioning process to construct a modern management framework where there really is a divergence between how legacy imaging works on the Windows machines and how we're doing it with Apple. I had to go through all the app catalog exercises, security compliance. I mean, we, we about hit sort of every bump you can hit in terms of what our customers are going through. That was an awesome learning experience because, again, it went from sort of the sales and the slideware to how do we actually service our internal community. So maybe give us, a, give us a feel for the people that are under your management who MDM is in play, Windows endpoint management is in play with some legacy tools, sort of different thinking, things we had to overcome, conceptual blockers. Give us a view of that. Sure. So I think a lot of the things when we look at is, and to answer some of your questions, uh, my purview is you know, of all the endpoint devices from PC to Macs um, to everything. It was a different, definitely different line of thinking. Um, and as you mentioned, we went through the assessment process and what Evan's going to walk you through in that methodology and those steps. Um, we followed, you know, kind of drank our own champagne, per se, of, of walking through those steps, identifying the requirements, um, running through the POCs with the end users to make sure everything was working correctly. Um, and it was a really great experience. And like Evan said, you know, we, we, we came across things along the way that pointed out things we could improve, things that we could do differently, which was important, which is a huge advantage to to our internal, uh, internal teammates and employees, right? So as we stepped through that process, um, the team, you know, and it was really great. And actually, to take a step back from what Evan said, too, it was really great to see our services and our internal IT groups work really together. Because a lot of times, when I've been at other companies, other places, there's some friction there. But really being in together, embedded in each other's day-to-day, um, -day and, and using that service is really important. Uh, a lot of value out of there, a lot of learnings, things we can pass on to the clients of what we run into on in our own infrastructure. So just, just overall great. And I think, as you mentioned too, I mean, some of the things that made that possible was using a product like Jamf, which is a best-in-class tool. I mean, just really excellent, right? I mean, the experience, the exposure we've had to that, getting our teammates and stuff up to speed on that that are going to support that in the back end with you know, Evan's groups. Uh, just, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say enough about just such a positive experience. Um, when I look at back at something like that and what we've been through and how we've changed that and how we're rolling into production, you know, the max with everything, as a, as a director, when I'm looking at staff or I'm looking at partners or people I work with, I always look at it from the standpoint of, hey, if I went somewhere else, if I did something, would I come back to them and do it again? Would I hire that person again? Would I work for that person? And that experience and what we've been through, I mean, it's a definite yes, uh, just from an internal perspective. And I know that'll carry through to the teammates and the end users. And I think that's an, a, a huge and very important point. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So I think we're going to, and, and by the way, uh, buyer beware, we have a ton of slideware, so I'm going to try to navigate it as quickly as possible and not deprive the room of too much oxygen, right? So uh, fundamentally, a little more context setting. Uh, the benefits of Apple, I think, go without saying, at least at, at this conference. Uh, what we're going after is hardened device. We want something that supports cross-departmental use cases and out-of-the-box compatibility with our environment, where we get at least closer to no step three, if not fully realize that. That is a vision that we have, and candidly, it, it's, this technology stack is not the only place we want to realize this. I think there's a significant architectural move in the industry wh where we're going to over-the-air provisioning, we're going to modern management, we want to em embrace that, but we see this at the, at the kind of vanguard of that discussion. So, um, when, if we're going to shift a little bit from uh, insights use cases, representative of the, of the industry, what's the offer that we built to sort of look at the trending and say, how can insight coming from the traditional resell context 
really extend into the entire set of use cases or the entire set of problem statements. So there's sort of three or four players to think about, right? There are folks that do really good supply chain work. Usually they have three letter acronyms, right? You see several of them represented here this week. There are folks that are kind of really good at the deployment end of this, and those usually end up being small boutique shops. They're small boutique integrators. There's some managed mobility services providers that get into the actual service desk outsourcing, but there hasn't been a single sort of entrant into the industry that has done everything and everything well from engagement all the way through extend. So we've, we've crafted a offer around um, Apple, and specifically we'll be talking about mostly Mac OS today, which t kind of takes into perspective what does it take for the consulting and professional services work to enable the environment how do we buy the technology? So key here would be Apple hardware and Jamf licensing. How do we get it deployed rapidly at scale using the latest configuration and deployment techniques? How do we support the landed device, the whole end user ecosystem? So think of not just MDM, but think of the first and third party apps, the integration components. How do we tie all that together level one through level three? And then fundamentally, how do we deal with break fix and reverse logistics, which ends up being the less sexy sort of component of this, but probably the most uh, salient topic in most of our customers' lexicon, which is I need to extend the life of this device, and what do I do once the life stops, right? Fundamentally, that's the that core sort of tenant of what we're doing. So these are the five pillars of inside managed mobility for Apple, engage, procure, deploy, perform, and extend. We've made a tremendous investment in services personnel to be able to execute all of these. We already have a really robust supply chain. We already have a really robust capability in terms of warehousing and scale deployment and our national repair center, but now we have all the consulting and professional services and managed services to sort of tie all of this together. So that's our response to some of the exciting trends we see around Apple and the enterprise, and we'll sort of dive into that uh, today. I'll make one note which I think is relevant to our conversation. The Insight internal IT use case is not to just buy all of these. So we're working with the internal IT department and understanding that we'll probably give level three sort of backstop engineering support for the integration components, for Jamf, things of that nature, while level one is gonna be handled by Matt and team. Maybe you can say a little more about how you yeah, see that cohesion. No, and that's a great point because yeah. As I mentioned with Insight, we, we, we have a program called Insight and Insight where we utilize our own services. So the service desks that our clients call into are the same service desks that our employees call into, right? And they're kind of insourced and internally that flows up. So our teams, uh, the model and everything fits in nicely to that infrastructure so you don't differentiate a different call path model or different support model. It fits in really well um, to, the, um, to the solution and what Evan's pointing out. So definitely a key point. So we're gonna look at these five pillars and kind of click through to the next level of detail. Again, it's a lot of slide wear, but I'll try to navigate through quickly. So fundamentally in terms of engagement, uh, one of the things that we think is gonna be a fundamental opportunity, but also a challenge, which frankly has been an interesting conversation with partners like Apple and partners like Jamf, which is if we're gonna get from the 500 MacBooks that the creatives are using or the executives are using or the software engineers are using, and that number is going to look like 10,000, uh, what does it mean in terms of readiness? What does it mean in terms of suitability? Oftentimes there is an integration and a professional services conversation that needs to happen. Right? If you sort of look at the whole Nomad stack of products, if you look what Apple professional services brings to the table, that the problem sets that they're solving are really about environmental readiness to get Macs and, and iOS devices mainlined at scale. So in our engagement process, this is sort of running into, all right, so you've got a stated objective, what is your architecture, what are your blockers, and then we're running hand in hand with Apple Professional Services, we're running hand in hand um, with Jamf, and we have actually our own methodology around, let's, let's kind of take you through a readiness assessment, let's start with the most fundamental topics and let's run all the way through, score your readiness essentially, <clears throat> and then tag on that professional services work that's necessary to sort of unblock those things that are standing in front of <coughs> consumption of the product. So engagement is really the first thing that we're driving. Um, this, again, gets into the level of detail around sort of the methodology and the topics that we're covering. This is by no means exhaustive, uh, but it's something that we need to get our clients thinking this way because we believe if the roadmap is constructed in an intelligent way that 
putting more and more devices into the environment and having successful sort of user experiences and outcomes is going to be that much easier down the road. I'll also add, this is something we did with Matt's team right at the beginning. So we partnered with Apple Professional Services. We did a tools assessment. We did an architecture assessment, talking about first and third party apps. How are we going to deal with this security issue? How are we going to deal with this usability or access issue? We went through that entire methodology. So maybe you can say a bit about yeah, sort of how the teams interacted together there. Absolutely. And the interaction was good. But the most important piece that we got out of the engage of the assessment that we talked about, I was actually able to get you know, a physical document with actions that would help improve the environment. So I was able to take those and then translate to those to my team for my tactical, my strategic plans on how we got from point A to get to point B to make it viable to increase Mac in the environment. And to me, that's extremely critical because now I can show my CIO, my SVP, my finance group of why I'm doing what I'm doing and how those actions support that long-term you know, endpoint of where we want to get to. And it was very clear. I think the, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a good assessment. And at the end, it was very, it was a good bullet pointed, you know, list of items that I could point to to say, hey, here's what I need to do. Here's what I need to do and by when. And it was very actionable, which to me is, you know, increases the credibility and the reason you want to yeah. do the assessment. <clears throat> I'll also add sort of an industry comment on this. I think for us to achieve the scale and the promise with Apple that I think we all take to be possible, if not probable. We've got to get from executing things like these, and I'll speak even as an internal customer and then as being in the industry doing this on behalf of customers, we've got to get from here is your scorecard and here is your roadmap to actual execution of making the scorecard look better and walking through the roadmap. So one of the consistent stories we're hearing from our customers is they did something like this maybe two or three years ago, maybe last month. They have a general, if not sort of tacit understanding of where the problems are, where the skeletons are hid, but they're not really stridently executing against that scorecard. And we think that as a partner that's already in the supply chain conversation with our customers and in the deployment conversation, we can tack on those services to actually say, it's not just about scoring you, it's about walking you through what does success look like. It's about the right services, resources, sort of at every step of the journey. And we think, again, to get from that example of sort of 500 to 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 to see the share shift into Apple, more and more of that work is gonna be necessary internally. And this is more on the strategic roadmap planning. Again, this is about targeted outcomes, and it's about an actual discrete map to get us there and executing hand-in-hand -hand with our customers or taking on the majority of that work ourselves. And this will get into some of the details around the technical and the strategic uh, planning. You'll see we've swim lane sort of the Apple PS that we resell and then the value-add services that we, that we bring forward. Again, Jamf is, is central to this conversation. The Nomad line of products is central to this conversation. But this is about taking the best of what the industry has in terms of Apple and Jamf and Insight Resources and plugging that together for the, uh, for the best customer outcome. So I think the second is kind of comes back to what is our legacy, right? We're a multi-billion dollar reseller of products. So we sell a ton of Apple gear. Um, I think depending on which metric you're assessing, we're close, if not the fastest growing corporate reseller. It's a, it's an, a strategic objective from our board all the way down to be standard bearer in terms of the Apple supply chain. The same is true of Jamf, by the way. This is a product that we're excited about. We're excited about taking it into our customers who are generally the enterprise buying demographic. So if you think of you know, our competitors, but we're all somewhat friendly, right? If you think in terms of SHI and CDW and those folks, they span markets, uh, but we tend to focus on the enterprise demographic. And this is something we're really excited about driving Apple and Jamf there. And fundamentally, this is really about how are you buying today? How do you want to package what you're buying with services? So Apple Financial Services becomes a pretty interesting input into that discussion. Do you want to tether the hardware, the licensing, and the services to a true as a service? Do you want to take components of that and bring it together? The most exciting conversations here, it's, it's not just about you know, e-commerce and device availability and how do we get from order to productivity. Those are good stories and things our customers need, but it's about really packaging solutions within the supply chain. Would you like me to read every single thing on every slide, by the way? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I'll say a bit about Apple Devices as a Service. So one of the interesting 
uh, conversations we're having. I was actually with the CIO of a, a large company in the Atlanta area two weeks ago. And he looked at me and he said, so uh, he actually called me son, which is always great in a meeting in front of your peers. Like, so tell me, son, um, uh, what's my ROI on this, right? It seems like the conversations we're having are CIOs and, and executive leadership and folks that are in Matt's similar position to Matt are kind of looking at it saying, okay, son, if I buy 10,000 Macs next year that I didn't buy last year and would have bought a PC, what is my ROI on this from a device perspective, right? So there's some pretty interesting packages around what's your refresh rate? Are you scraping for the residuals in terms of financial services that can kind of balance that arithmetic? But oftentimes the conversation gets to the rock bottom concept, which is it's more persistent device, it's a harder device, it's a better user experience. Folks are more productive because they have the choice. Their level of employee satisfaction is going up. There's intangible inputs into that discussion. It's not just a hard cost discussion. That said, that sets the foundation for a more interesting dialogue, which is if you look at Insight Managed Mobility for Apple and you were to push all of that work to us, what is the ROI versus doing that internally? So you start to layer these finance conversations, hardware conversations versus PC, then you get in-source versus outsource of service or a hybrid. There's some really interesting modeling conversations. That may not be exciting to some, right? But if you're in the outsourcing business like we are, that is exciting because those are the fundamental decision points. So in terms of deploy, we've made some really interesting investments um, in this area. And let me skip to device provisioning. The character of what we're seeing is that the architecture is actually outpacing uh, customers' ability to consume it. And generally speaking, they have some requirements that even if you're hooking up all of the best of, for instance, Apple's framework with Jamf, usually there is some touch of the device still necessary, especially in line of business centric use cases where we're dealing, going from up here to up here in the value chain, right? So think of a couple of easy ones, healthcare. Think of point of sale. <clears throat> where the, the topic is, I've got an Apple device and I need to bring it all the way to my customer's customer. Usually there's several physical components, there's several integration points, and there's several apps that all have to be ready to go day one out of the box. So we've taken advantage of um, all of the out-of-the-box technology, even custom scripting. We have proprietary tools that are deployed in our lab. And fundamentally, you package all of that with the warehousing capability and with uh, components. Does someone have a bottle of water, by the way? I'm sorry. <laughs> Losing steam. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Oh, nice catch. Well done. <laughs> that was planned. So if you look at the facility we have in Hanover Park, Chicago, basically a combination of how do you get thousands of devices through the machine, combine that with the supply chain, the warehousing, uh, the customer-owned inventory, You've got all the engineering and Apple infrastructure co-located there. And this is something we can offer our clients to get them from heavy touch to zero touch and rapid deployment very quickly. So I talked about break fix being at the center of most customer conversations. Zero touch and scaled deployment is probably second on that list. And we're really excited about use cases where we're close to the value in our customer's business. We're very excited about supporting knowledge workers. We want that as well. But when you get into these sort of above the wing scenarios, the, um, the in-room experience in the hospital, uh, hospitality point of sale, becomes very, very dynamic what we're doing in that space. Yeah, Evan, if I could comment on that. I think, Absolutely. I think the, first I'd like to say thank you, son. But uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I had to work that in somewhere after that. But uh, really, to, from the provisioning standpoint, um, and the zero touch, from an internal perspective, I, I just think the world of that, because of, when we're talking about procure, and you're talking about configuration, we're buying machines, they're going through a lab process, people are touching stuff, it gets shipped out. Under this methodology, um, I look at it from twofold, from a refresh, from getting people up to speed a lot quicker, but also from an acquisition stat strategy. So as we've acquired companies, you know, we have the task of taking them and moving them from a environment to the inside environment. And, and with this and this ability, it really speeds up that process and, and takes it from a manual effort and a more cumbersome effort with a long time frame and shrinks that down. And I think that's an important piece and it's just a huge advantage when, when I look at you know, migrating folks and bringing two companies together 
uh, from that standpoint. I mean, really, I really hit on that because I see a huge benefit there. I mean, when I'm looking at now and we've acquired companies over the last couple years, you know, it's months and months of work and manual labor. This really shrinks it down. And now when we're looking at companies that, we've, that we're migrating in, if they have a different onboarding process that might be X number of days or they're coming in, this really is a huge advantage because you're getting someone up to speed, you're getting them productive, it's less <clears throat> impactful, it's a shorter time frame. I really can't speak enough about the advantages that come to that. And I can put ROIs to that, I can talk about minimized costs, but just from the smell test at a high level, I mean, what an advantage for yeah. that. Um, I'm gonna go through there. So I think the North Star for us is exactly what IBM so well exemplified in the session yesterday. Most of our clients use cases though, it's, it's something underneath that which is there's some limitation of what the MDM can do in the actual operating system framework. So there's some manual intervention needed, uh, some scripting needed, even tethering the devices needed. I'm thinking of some large projects we've run through the lab recently. So we can move our customers up the architecture stack, we can innovate up to a point, but then you actually need bodies, you need space, you need the ability to deliver at scale. So this is a side of the business that we're really excited about and has uh, candidly grown like a weed for us. Um, so state-of-the-art facility, it's been a big investment uh, for us, so fundamentally very scalable. Um, right now we're running 800 plus devices a day, but that'll go to well over 1,000 soon. Um, physical build-out, uh, large facilities investment in terms of security, and, and also the network backbone to support it. So fundamentally, if you can get from, you've done the right consulting and professional services, you've hooked up the right supply chain, you've deployed your customers, you've automated them, you've gotten them closer to zero touch, you've got the devices at scale, the time to value is compressed. Once the device is landed, uh, that's when really our managed services take over. So from level one through level three, all the way to typical contact center, I've got a password issue, so I'm calling the help desk, all the way to more sophisticated engineering tasks into the back end systems or even back to the OEMs, the publishers like a Jamf, working hand in hand to support our clients from an admin to admin perspective. So again, we think of this as a differentiator, right? There are folks that do a lot of integration work. There are folks that do a lot of supply chain work. Most of them are here uh, today. There are folks that do a lot of deployment work, but when you couple those together with once the device lands, Insight can really support you through the entire user experience, level one through level three. And again, most of our deals are hybrid in the sense of we're working with an internal IT department. Most of them are not just pure outsource. But when you talk to your customers candidly about how do I get from X, meaning my current level of deployment and adoption, to Y, which is my aspiration, there's got to be some sort of services partnership, short of just scaling out massively internal IT departments to support. So we're a fully vested ASP with Apple. Um, it's been an interesting journey in terms of how do we take a look at the MDM ecosystem? How do we take a look at Apple's framework, Apple's professional services, our own services and capability, and wrap offerings that are cost effective uh, and also interesting to the customer in that they're not fragmented. Typical sort of single throat to choke in terms of uh, how we present this to the customer. There's been a lot of work, a lot of design that's gone into that. But we're proud of what this looks like. Because again, depending upon your needs, this can be all shifted out to insight. <clears throat> so Matt, maybe you can kind of say one more thing in terms of, of level one through level three support. I mean, you're managing not just an ecosystem that contains Apple and Jamf, <laughs> but God knows how many other logos. How do you think about a partner like Insight Services when it comes to your handling maybe a level one or a desk side, but you need someone to sort of take the complexity out when it comes to dealing with the administrative issues, the actual product issues, and so on? Really, um, when I think of Insight Services, I mean, honestly, they're my first choice. And I would go back again to what I, you know, what I even said earlier, reiterate it. If I were to go somewhere else, these would be the folks that I'd turn to. Because um, we manage, if you know Insight, and, you know, we've got a lot of partnerships, we sell a lot of products, we have a lot of services. Um, and be able to go to them as experts where they've got you know, multiple expertise, a deep level of understanding of the products and the services for that support, um, it helps me sleep better at night, honestly. Um, and just the, the people and the quality of, of the folks that we deal with um, internal to Insight, and as well as the, the folks at Apple and the folks at Jamf, um, I, I just can't say enough about it, quite honestly, and, and what that experience has been. Um, even, even in times when we've needed something, we've reached out, um, they've been there to assist, 
And again, the level of expertise they provided is invaluable. So I won't uh, yammer on about Gartner categories, but the right way to read this slide, if you look at sort of industry nomenclatures, there's three things that we're taking advantage of in terms of convergence. One is workplace services. So think of all the major outsourcers that are in the uh, <clears throat> sort of negative one all the way up through level three business in terms of taking that on on behalf of their customers. Think about managed mobility services, which are boutique operators, Fundamentally, a lot of carrier services, a lot of iOS, and a lot of Android. That's what gave rise to that industry. Then think of what the analysts are now calling PC as a service, which, by, by the way, isn't locked into PC versus Apple. The, the fundamentals are how do we wrap together supply chain, deployment, support, and full life cycle. Right? The convergence of those three areas is what we're reading into this comprehensive support structure. So... Uh, we want to sort of automate and innovate as much incidents out of the ecosystem as possible. We want to get in things like uh, preemptive healing, like really advanced analytics so we can sort of solve problems before they start in terms of incidents at scale, all the way up through the more complex technical services. So there's a lot of folks that are in this business. We think there's actually no one in this business that pairs the Apple ecosystem uh, with our capabilities in terms of deployment and supply chain and break fix brings it all together. If you look at some of the core logos, I'll say it again, workplace services, managed mobility services, and PC as a service, you've got some overlap, but no one without heavy dependency on subcontractors is really gluing it all together. So in terms of the ecosystem, um, will not be a surprise to anyone in this room that Mac OS and iOS are core to it, certainly Jamf, the uh, the Azure discussion around conditional access and sort of identity and directory writ large and how Nomad plugs in and Enterprise Connect and things of that nature. It's going to be <laughs> fundamental to that discussion. <laughs> like my, Brit my Britney Spears earpiece has there left me. Go. There you go, all son. At once. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, so it gives you a view of that as well. So the fifth pillar, and I'll, I'll speed up and then we can leave some time for questions, uh, probably uh, not as sexy as anything else that we've discussed, but there's some pretty interesting things going on around Apple's strategic objective to sort of saturate the enterprise with great devices that produce great experiences, but give the end user or the customer at large, the IT department, a great sort of support experience. So Apple Care is really important to us. We've wrapped our services offerings around it in this way, and we fundamentally want insight services to be consumed, but we want the bedrock of break, fix, reverse logistics, and how an issue is dealt with in the Apple ecosystem to be underpinned by Apple Care. This is the conversation that takes up the majority of our time. If you're not having it internally, uh, my bets are in the next 12 months it occurs, right? Because you can kind of see the convergence between um, higher price devices, high residual value, something that's foreign to the ecosystem at scale, and then how do we think about this in terms of life cycle and refresh. Uh, but again, we are one pane of glass sitting behind that, and we go all the way through uh, the warranty services, all the way to asset um, dispositioning, reverse logistics, uh, disposal, and so on. So to kind of put a, a tie on it, and this is the 2017 iteration of the IBM study that I think we're all familiar with, uh, the strategic intent of Insight is to be the enterprise partner for all five pillars of what we view to be a comprehensive program around Apple, and then to help catalyze the cost savings, the user experience benefits, and the productivity benefits of Apple saturated at scale in the enterprise. That really is the intent. Uh, the nice thing about the five pillars is you can consume one of them, you can consume all five of them, uh, but we want to be in that business. It can be piece and parts with some clients, it can be a full outsource with others, but we think this is going to be fundamental to catalyzing uh, both Apple and Jam sort of objectives in the enterprise. So that is the summary statement of our value. Um, we believe that it is the supply chain bedrock that actually has positioned us to have the most interesting story in terms of deploy, in terms of support, in terms of break fix, and so on. Um, and we'd encourage you to have sort of any conversation that's relevant to what we've talked about with Insight. So thank you for your time. We've got 10 minutes. Any questions, concerns, disagreements? Now's the time to throw rocks. Fire away. I'd encourage it, actually. No more water bottles, though. I'm yes. good with that. Any I'm questions at all, really? I mean. In terms of our experience in internal IT or our experience on the commercial side? 
Don't make me force my team to ask a I, question, please. I told them we needed fireworks and smoke and that stuff. That would be awkward. But, you know. Good? Too quiet. It is quiet. It was sort of strange circular. Do we have writing. any prizes to give for <laughs> questions? Or? Was, there, was there any hesitations um, as you thought about implementing a choice program? And then if you look back on it, was there any lessons learned from the situation? So I'll, I'll comment, and I know Matt has comments. Uh, there's a weird FP&A input into this discussion, which is who is paying for the devices. Uh, so there's sort of two flavors of this that we run into, which is there's a robust sort of allocation or chargeback, so where the business unit is running a P&L and they're saying I'm taking on X amount increase because I'm bringing in Apple. Again, you can put together competitive models, but I think we've got to be unapologetic about it's a better device, better experience, uh, but there's a higher price tag on that. Uh, so it becomes that discussion or it's a completely peanut butter spread centralized IT budget, and then you just have to sort of look at that in terms of uplift and SGNA. So in terms of the discussion to bring it into the main line, meaning it's transparently available on the baseline, any user that's in a refresh or in a net new higher position can choose it or something else, I think that's the question. Maybe you can say how we dealt with that. Yeah, and one? we're one of the ones that it's more of a centralized cost model where all the expenses with that come into IT. So it wasn't so much as a hesitation of what I find with this change, it's more of a show the value, right? So when I can show the value, it's a lot easier to, to implement that change. So when you see the value of employee satisfaction, when you see the value of the productivity, when you see the value of being able to get someone up, you know, up to speed quicker, it's a lot easier conversation because usually those costs are offset by an increase here by somewhere else. So I wouldn't say it was a hesitation as much as a process of here's where the other things are going to change and here's what you get out of it. Right, and being able to articulate that and show that to, to the other departments. I think the nice part is user demand ends up taking some of the complexity out of the equation. So there is a hardware or sort of ROI model to be had. There's an outsource versus in-source model to be had in terms of all of the pillars of our services. But generally speaking, you're having the conversation with your customers because there's been such a strong demand that they right. fundamentally can't say no. That's a great position to argue in, by the way. And, and we also see a lot of it. So. I mean, we could see a lot of it coming to from, from HR, just on the feedback when you're hiring teammates and the desire to have a choice, right? And the desire to go a certain direction. So that encapsulated with what I said. I think, you know, it was a foregone conclusion yeah. where we we're going. And it was just the how and, uh, to get there. Absolutely. But the what and the whys were there. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So more a question. Sorry, more a question. Nice. To is essentially, is how are you supporting these devices before implementing this approach? So, what did the support team look like, and what does the support team look like today, in alignment with yeah, this? Sure. So, do you still have a support team, or have you moved completely to? So there is still a support team because we're in the middle of the transition and the support um, of what we've rolled out as it scales in the environment. So I would say. It was a manual. It was more manual to where now it's more automated, right? So, and a lot of people get scared when they hear that because they think, oh, staffing reductions, but what it's able to do is going to focus their time on more important things, right? So you've been automated and you've taken this piece out of the equation. Now I can go add stuff that'll drive revenue for the company or reduce cost or, and make people more efficient. So um, that's what I've kind of seen because now, I mean, I'll even use an example today as we know that, you know, as we're doing what we're doing, I'm, you know, we're going to get more productivity. Even off of a few sessions of here, I've probably already texted my group saying, hey, I want to add this to the roadmap. You do this just at what I've seen out of this conference and some capabilities. So that's where, that's what I think um, the kind of the change is. It's not necessarily as a reduction in people, but now I can add value in a different way because where I couldn't get to this important project before, I don't have to worry about deploying PCs or Macs anymore, right? I go do that. Go do X, right? If that makes sense. Yes, sir. So, just a question about the first phase. I think it's the engage phase, number one. Um, you're doing the environmental assessments. Mm -hmm. How long does that typically take, and what are you looking at? Yeah, so it, it, it's interesting. The, the sequence for us generally is two to four hours, stakeholders, whiteboard. Just get broad concepts down, right? Strategic intent, fundamental architecture in terms of endpoint management. Oftentimes it's identity and access. Um, baseline compliance, meaning what are you managing 
on the device, meaning how many agents do you have, how is this driven by the CISO and team, try to get all of that mapping done and out, that's about a two to four hour scenario. That often includes, we did something with Apple Professional Services, we have some Jamf licensing, uh, here's, our, here's our core use cases and so on. Then, very quickly, right, depending on the ins and outs of that discussion, we would move to an assessment. An assessment is something that we would like to cap on a week or two, let's say, right? We don't want to turn it into a science project. And to me, that's just the decomposition of everything we just talked about, which is a, if there are security blockers, what are they? Are you trying to map things from your sort of PC reference architecture and compliancy to policy over here? How can we remove complexity from that truly understanding your roadmap, sort of truly understanding, I would say, integration in the ecosystem, app compatibility, identity, and access. You start talking about all the things inherent to that, and then at the end of the assessment, what we're gonna come out with, and this could be a couple of flavors, right? It could be us working in concert with Apple on their readiness assessment and then kind of adding edges to that, or it could be something that's more focused and more directed. Uh, we're going to turn over a scorecard and a roadmap to them. And from a services provider, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna apologize about this, that thing is the guide of how I go monetize, right? Because then I can say, of the 19 and a half things you need to do for environmental readiness to hit Apple at scale, you're doing 10 of them, I'm doing nine and a half, or there's gonna be some balance in that equation. The nice thing about it is, I think we now have an answer, and an aggressive answer, where the industry has hiccuped here a little bit, frankly. Uh, really good at the we want Mac as a choice. We know what the problems are. Really good at those statements. There seems to be great industry focus around that. We, the North Star is what IBM is doing, great, we want that. How do I actually get from A to B, and how do I get there quickly? And that really is the focus of scorecard, roadmap, now how do we work together to get there? So you're talking about four hours on a whiteboard, probably a week or two in terms of hands-on assessment. Uh, and then you're talking about a few week sort of turnaround to here's your artifacts, here's where we'd like to help you, what does success look like? That's something that we want to get through quickly. Uh, we don't want to just throw bodies on site and keep talking day after day after day. It's very prescriptive, it's sort of very formulaic, and we want to get to the actual execution. Yeah. I would say that was a fair time frame of what we experienced yeah. internally we went through it. Um, the only caveats I'd add, it would probably depend on the level of documentation and stuff you have within yeah. your infrastructure. So there were some things we had very well documented where I able to hand over, say, hey, here's our hardening guide, here's how we do this. If there were some things that weren't as well documented, maybe that was a few extra meetings or some discussions on how we did things, yeah. right? So I, I think there's some level of dependency on the availability right. information, but I mean, that was, that was right, right. In, in line with what we experienced. In a, and of the four hours on the whiteboard, three hours and 58 minutes are a, a repetition of the following, which is, wait, I, I'm not binding and I'm creating a local account wait a minute, I'm not binding, <laughs> what does that mean? Or even, but I, I deployed something like Nomad, this actually came up last week, I deployed Enterprise Connect, uh, but we, we still need to, to bind, right, right? I mean, it's that sort of conversation. Some <laughs> customers are way beyond that, some hang up there. Another customer I'm thinking of, 13 agents, that was the baseline on their PC. I've gotta get those 13 and put them on the Mac. It's like, please run screaming in the other direction, right? It's those sorts of things that even when you've got great engineers in the room, the great engineer is often saying to us, I get it, I buy it, we need to do that, but there's some policy, there's some compliance issue, there's some even political issue. How do we maneuver through that in terms of organizational change management and readiness? So it can take on a lot of different dimensions. Sometimes it can go very wide, sometimes it's incredibly narrow, so let's talk about Active Directory for four hours and so on. So a lot of different shades there. And, and a couple other things I'd note too that I was thinking about as you were talking is, one of the things that I think helped us through it too is we prioritized it and we had some ideas of what was gonna be needed during the assessment so we were able to pre-stage some stuff. So I think that's important with any assessment with some of those because if it's got priority and it's got eyes on it and you've got some time to go back to your groups to say, hey, yeah. here's some of the stuff they're gonna ask, collect this, this and this, or pull our guides or whatever else. I think that helps the, the process go a little yeah. bit quicker too. It, and I'll also add, and I know we're at time here, I'll also add that I can't tell you how many customer conversations I've been in where we have true advocates in the room from the engineering team in IT, but they needed something in terms of artifact, they needed something in terms of here's a prescriptive method that I can go use in other conversations to get the green lights internally. 
Because unfortunately, it often is a CIO, a CFO, someone with a squinty eye saying, oh, it's the Apple people, it's the engineers, I don't, frankly, I don't have time to deal with that shit today. Or something like that is the, is the dialogue. Rather, here is something where we did an assessment. Here's something where we ran through a prescription. This is what needs to happen. This is why it's important. Here are the cost models. Here are the blockers. Here are the stated outcomes. That can be really for lack of a better term, weaponized internally for our advocates and stakeholders around the growth of Apple and the enterprise. So we are at time. time. Thanks for your patience, especially with all the snafus. Have a great yeah. day. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>